it's interesting how when we look back over time in the dream diary you can start to spot those patterns and it tells us or gives us some clues as to why we're having those dreams when we're having them so we're able then to interpret them or explore them in our own and in answers in the dark i actually give people tips on how to decode their own dreams i'm very careful in the book to say that it's not a dream dictionary it's a way of helping you explore your own dreams because i genuinely believe that you have everything you need to decode them it's just a process of unpacking it and exploring it maybe with the help of someone else but certainly beginning that journey of exploration to see you know what it might mean for you are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better then welcome to my podcast i'm bob nickman and this is the exploding human Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who is out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. Today we travel across the pond to speak with Delphi Ellis about dreams and her new book, Answers in the Dark. But first, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can listen to episodes, read synopses, see photos of my guests, little bio on myself, and there's a donate button if you'd like to support the show through Patreon. Thank you very much. There's also a YouTube channel where you can listen. That is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman, and the Exploding Human Facebook page. As I mentioned, my guest today is Delphi Ellis. She is across the pond in uh, England, or whatever we want to call it this week, Great Britain, the UK, many names. We're going to be talking about lucid dreaming, the interpretation of dreams, the advantages to keeping a dream diary, something I did many years ago, which I may have to start doing again. It was pretty great. And how dreams can help us heal grief. She also gives tips on how to fall back asleep if you uh, are waking up with uh, agitation and anxiety. And how dreams can help us in the creative process. So if you're interested in all aspects of dreams and what they might mean and how we can lead a better life when we're not asleep, this is a really important episode. I had a blast talking to her. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Delphi Ellis. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to The Exploding Human. I'm with Delphi Ellis, who is 50 miles, well, I'm going to say miles, but you don't say miles, north we of London. Miles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you say miles or did you say yeah. kilometers? Oh, you did say miles. miles. Yeah. Oh, thank you for interpreting the uh, distance from Britain to American. Now, do you <laughs> say Britain, UK, or Great Britain, or England? Uh, it, it just depends, I think, on on what's going on in the media. But at the moment, I think we're Great Britain, but um, UK okay. is fine. England is fine. <laughs> <laughs> is there a not so Great Britain? Because... Oh, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> that's a whole other talk. <laughs> I always wonder about that because it's Great Britain. Well, it's got to be compared to something that isn't so great. It's just regular Britain. <laughs> Um, I don't know what I'm talking about. I can probably edit this out. So it's great to meet you. And uh, I know um, one of the things that we were just talking before, before uh, we started recording about how you got into dream analysis, dream interpretation, just the whole world of dreams. Cause I think most people are super interested in that. It's like, what just happened? You know, you get up and you, and sometimes it isn't just a dream. It's an experience. It feels even more real than sort of your conventional, like, Oh, that was weird. I, you know, went to a building and I walked in a door and then I was in a garden outside, you know, it's a, you know, that, that kind of odd stuff, but then there's things that feel like they're experiences and I'm talking way too much. <laughs> so go ahead. Tell us, tell, well, tell me how, how you got into this and what, what's the history of your interest in this? Well, thank you so much. So 
I actually talk about this in my book, Answers in the Dark, and, and I talk about how my interest in dreams and dream exploration really started as a little girl. I remember sitting around the breakfast table and talking um, to my mum about the dreams I'd had the night before. And it was only really when I went to school that I realised that was quite unique. That wasn't something that was happening around every table in the UK. That, that was something quite unique to my household. And and I remember, you know, my mum talking to me about different ways of interpreting dreams and different ways of approaching dreams. Um, she had this wonderful dream book by uh, a, a dream analyst at the time called Neris D. And I still have that book to this day. It's, it's falling apart, but I still have that book to this day. And it was very much about considering all the different aspects of dreaming and what they might mean. So one of the things that I kind of grew up with this philosophy was that when we talk about dreams, it's really important that we consider all possible options. So whereas some people might tend to focus on perhaps a Freudian analysis or a Jungian analysis, you know, from, from the researchers like Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud, I was very much brought up to think bigger than that. So big picture thinking and rather than kind of pigeonholing a dream into a particular category, I've always believed that if we only ever looked at it from one perspective, we're just getting one bite of the apple. So um, whenever I've explored dreams with people over the last sort of 20 years, when I've been working with them professionally, I very much worked with it more as an exploration rather than an interpretation, rather than sort of saying your dream means this. I would work with people on the basis of saying, well, when you think about that, what does that kind of prompt for you? Or when that was happening in the dream, how did you feel about that? So it was always very much an exploration rather than a sort of a, a, a rigid kind of interpretation of what that dream might mean, because everybody is different. You know, what one dream means to me could mean something completely different to you. So in Answers in the Dark, I talk about uh, this, my experiences growing up as, as a child and, and this kind of that then expanding into my work as a therapist as a counsellor and um, because when I was working as a counsellor so often people would want to talk to me about the dreams they were having you know they, they'd want to explore and unpack them with me so um, yeah that's pretty much how I kind of got into this arena and and was able to use those kind of childhood experiences to inform the work I do now. I think that's so cool that your your mom was uh, wanting to talk to you about that stuff. Yeah, wow. yeah. She she was. Uh, it was a very interesting childhood growing up. Where um, I mean, we had a statue of Aphrodite in our front room. You know, we had a black cat. Um, you know, I used to listen to my mum doing the I Ching before we went to bed, which is a form of divination tool. So this was not your sort of average suburban household. It was a very um, you know different experience. But one of the benefits of that was that it meant that I had this knowledge and this wisdom that I took into the work that I then did. I think without those experiences, I perhaps wouldn't have been as interested in the work as I am now. So, and like I say, because we always approached it from so many different perspectives, that also gave me the philosophy that we need to remember that everybody is different. So something I was saying to someone the other day is that when we talk about dream exploration, we have to be careful not just to look at it from a Western perspective, mm. right? We need to look at it from a global perspective because what we interpret dreams as in the West might be completely different to somebody in an Eastern country. So it's, yeah, it's, it's given me that opportunity to kind of look at this from the big picture perspective. I was thinking about a couple of recurring dreams that I had as a kid. Um, and one of them, which frightened me, I'll just tell you that, was that I would go upstairs, up a, a set of stairs, usually outdoor stairs, and they would crumble behind me and I'd be stuck mm. up on a landing. And I had it over and over again, uh, you know, crumbling foundations. And I had other dreams like that too, where like the ground underneath me was unstable, um, something underground, like an electric wire was trying to kill me. Uh, mm. So I had a lot of these unstable uh, uh ground dreams and they really freaked me out when I was a kid. Yeah. I, and I remember thinking, um, something's wrong, <laughs> like getting up going, Oh man, that's just, you know, that's my scary dream. 
Mm, yeah, I, I have to say, I talk about this in Answers in the Dark. One of the things that I talk about is how we are naturally quite, ter- well, we're terrified of the dark, first of all, and first and foremost. So even being awake in the middle of the night for a lot of people is scary. You know, it brings up, back, it brings up all sorts of things for people for lots of different reasons as well. You know, sometimes with good reasons. Um But at the same time, um, one of the things that I talk about in Answers in the Dark is the fact that when we wake up after a dream like that, we immediately assume what's wrong with me. We start going down that road of there's something wrong with me. Why would I have a dream like that? Especially if the dreams are unsettling, disturbing, scary. Um, And so we instinctively think there's something wrong with me. And one of the ways I describe dreams in the book is as a form of nighttime therapy. They're actually a way of working through some of our difficulties especially if we're not being given permission to talk about them during the day so you know if I'm going through a difficult time for example whether it's in a relationship or or whether it's uh, I'm having difficulties at work if I don't feel able to express that whether physically verbally emotionally during the day it's probably going to show up in my dreams at night. So, um, and it was interesting what you said. I I don't know if you unpacked that dream at the time, but certainly recurring dreams, I think are really helpful because we can start to spot patterns in our dreaming if we keep a dream diary. So one of the things I actively encourage is for dreamers to keep a dream diary so they can start to notice why they have certain dreams when they do. Some people will find, one of the things I talk about in the book is some people will Will find that they're back at school taking their exams and they don't know why they're back at school taking their exams and they don't feel ready it's almost as if the exam has just been sprung on them and sometimes dreams are just telling us you know how stressed you were when you were back at school taking your exams you're that stressed now so sometimes we can unpack dreams metaphorically Schools are about learning. We might be going through a period of learning at the time of the dream, but it might also be the imprint of that memory. You know, so if the stress that we felt at the time we were at school taking exams is still very much in our lives at the moment for another reason, it might just be the dream is saying to you, you know how stressed you were back then? You're that stressed now. And that's one of the reasons I refer to dreams in the book as like a friend, because they're giving you advice or they're giving you wisdom or knowledge or insight. But like any friend you can take it with a pinch of salt and ignore it if you want to you don't have to follow their advice it's just something that they could you know offer you and and we can look at it objectively or we can kind of say yeah I'm not going to think about that right now it's it's our choice yeah so it's very wide open obviously to interpretation but I think what you just said was how how did it, how did you feel about what happened mm. um I love the flying dreams. I love when I run and take off and fly and I have so much uh, freedom and strength and I'm going over, you know, huge, vast areas of land. And I just love those. And I think people, I don't know if I'm the only one that loves it. It just, I don't know how you could not, but it's such, what is, what is flying usually mean or can it mean not usually but can it mean yeah I mean it's it's so interesting because again I've spoken to people around the world that have had the flying dream and I would say out of all the dreams that I've worked with over the years that's probably one of the most common dreams that people have but what's interesting and when I'm talking about as I'm sure you and when you're talking about the flying dream you're talking about flying like Superman right not in an airplane you're talking like yes. oh yeah, yeah like yeah. flying like Superman. Yeah. And, and I've spoken to people around the world and what's, there's so many th- interesting things about this, but one of them is that when I speak to people and I don't know what it's like for you, but when they're flying in a dream, um, some of them, for example, are flying like Superman. Some of them fly uh, like they're doing breaststroke or front crawl swimming. Um, <laughs> and when I fly in my dreams, I fly like Iron Man. So I have thrusters in my hands and I can kind of push down and and they, you know, I go faster or if I if I let off the thrusters, I, I slow down. So um, what's so interesting about that is the, the different way people fly around the world. It's not even just one, you know, one way in, in that sense. But the other thing that's interesting about the flying dreams and there are different interpretations of it. So for people that love the flying dream, um, we sometimes think of it in metaphor. Like I'm flying high at the time of the dream. So it might be that things are good and you feel settled and life is, you know, 
know, just generally kind of like that high achiever, high aspirations, or just that flying high experience. For people that don't tend to like the flying dream, that could represent at the time of the dream that they're perhaps not feeling grounded, or, you know, they're perhaps feeling like the grounds, they've got no ground underneath their feet. So a bit like the rug's been pulled out from underneath them. Um, But another interesting concept of the flying dream is when people become aware of the fact that they're flying in the dream. So one of the things about lucid dreaming, um, which I touch on uh, in Answers in the Dark, but I refer mainly to the work of Charlie Morley because he's done a heap of work in this area, is that for some people, lucid dreaming is essentially about becoming aware of the fact that you're dreaming in the dream. And for some people, when they become aware that they're dreaming, and it's usually when they know that something is not quite right in the dream. So flying is a classic example of that because your brain is saying this can't be real because you're flying. Um, So so it's usually at that point that a lot of people will wake up. They'll realize it's a dream and they wake up. But for some people, and Charlie Morley refers to this in his books, and I kind of refer to it in mine, is some people can actually then, having become aware in the dream that they are flying, can then control their dream. So they remain lucid and they remain dreaming but are then able to control further that experience of flying so much as I did where I can kind of push on the thrusters and control what I'm doing you know other people in their dreams they'll fly through walls or you know it's almost like reality just kind of blends and merges and it's like what is real um and they're able then to really transform their dream experience just because they've become aware of the fact they're dreaming so yeah quite a quite an interesting phenomenon yeah i've had hints of being able to control it but it doesn't last as long as i would like Mm -hmm. because i remember saying to myself you know what i'm going to do now that i am you know and then i can't yeah all of a sudden yeah Uh, um but it's uh I, I love going to sleep because I like to see what's going to happen Yeah. when I dream. Yeah. And I do, I, I have a pretty good memory for dreams. Um, and I did, and I, I like that you're at, uh, recommending people do a dream journal because I did do that for about six months, many years ago. And I, I wrote down, when I, right when I'd wake up, I'd write it down. Then I got a tape recorder, a voice activated tape recorder. <laughs> so I wouldn't have to open my eyes and I could just say the dream into the recorder. That was pretty interesting. It's, it's something I actively recommend because like I say, I mean, I, um, I've kept a dream diary for as long as I can remember for obvious reasons. And I remember looking at my dream diary from must have been about 15, 20 years ago. And it was about the time when I was just starting this work from the professional perspective. And what was really interesting about that was that at the time that was kind of, I was making these steps into this arena, um, professionally speaking, I noticed that I was having a recurring dream that I couldn't find a parking space. And it was only when I looked back in the dream diary and I saw how regularly at that time in my life, I was having this recurring dream that I couldn't find a parking space that I realized that it was because at the time I was making decisions about where I fit in, you know, in terms of professionally and and what work I wanted to do and which arena I wanted to focus in. Um, And so to me, that made perfect sense. I couldn't find a parking space. It was my dreams way of saying, you're feeling a bit lost at the moment. You're perhaps not sure where you fit in. Um, And it was just interesting. And and I've never had that dream again, you know, since I've moved into this arena and I'm I'm doing the work that I do now, I've never had that dream again. So it's interesting how when we look back over time in the dream diary, you can start to spot those patterns. And it tells us or gives us some clues as to why we're having those dreams when we're having them. So we're able then to to interpret them or explore them in our own. And in Answers in the Dark, I actually give people tips on how to decode their own dreams. I'm very careful in the book to say that it's not a dream dictionary. It's a way of helping you explore your own dreams because I genuinely believe that you have everything you need to decode them. It's just a process of unpacking it and exploring it, maybe with the help of someone else, but certainly beginning that journey of exploration to see you know, what it might mean for you. The human mind is so fascinating and what what a great uh, way to process, you know, uh, the waking hours. You mm. get to, you get to live twice in, in a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah. 
Um, and well, t- speaking about your book, uh, I I know that you um, use uh, dreams in in your therapy, and that you you deal a lot with uh, things that are um, things like suicide or uh, violence, uh, you know, and using dreams to help heal grief. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of types of grief. You know, there's the very obvious one, which is um, somebody died mm-hmm. or was you know hurt in some way. But then there's grief about a lot of stuff, lo- different types of losses and uh, things that you know you didn't get maybe or lo- you know. And, and it's, um, I mean, it it almost seems like the underpinning of most of our issues in in life is that there's a grief about something that didn't go the way that it we had hoped exactly that you're so right and and one of the concepts of answers in the dark the subtitle of answers in the dark is grief sleep and how dreams can help you heal and it's because in my work over the last 20 years i've been working with people predominantly who have been bereaved by murder and suicide and so over that time as i said people have wanted to share with me the dreams that they've had and the experiences that they've had especially when they are still processing what's happened to them in terms of their dreams you know sometimes their dreams can be quite vivid or they could be quite cruel and so we would talk and and unpack and explore those but one of the things that came really to the front of my work over the years was the fact that grief doesn't just belong to death and I think that's something certainly in western society and certainly in the UK I don't think we've quite caught up with that, Um, that grief doesn't just belong to death. The pandemic, I think, really brought that home to us in some ways, because we can quite as exactly as you said, we can experience loss for anything that mattered to us that's no longer there. So it could be being made redundant or it could be a relationship breakdown it could be a child leaving home to go to university and we can experience loss in so many different ways which are accompanied with grief so it's natural for us to feel grief for anything that we've lost that mattered to us and that's no longer there but I don't think society quite gives us permission to grieve for those things And so one of the things I argue in Answers in the Dark is that we need as a society, we need to start to realise how grief shows up for us. And if we're not being given permission to grieve during the day, it will go underground and it will show up in the dreams that we are having at night. So it might be that we have sometimes, you know, those um, disturbing dreams, which we might call nightmares, is um is a reflection if you like of the things that we're not dealing with during the day there's a quote in the book where i say that you know our problems are often like a hole that we walk around during the day but fall into at night um and that's as much true as dreaming as it is for and i have a a whole chapter in the book called into darkness because it's about the fact that um it's not just Uh, our dreams at night that can cause us to feel upset frustrated scared it can be lying awake in the middle of the night I have another chapter in answers in the dark called the 4am mystery which is all about why we're awake in the middle of the night and how it's in those moments that the darkness comes you know it could be an argument that you had with somebody 20 years ago you know that you're suddenly starting to process again when you wake up when you you know when you get up in the morning at seven you think why was I so indulged in that why was I so entrenched in that in the middle of the night but in the middle of the night and in that darkness it can feel really intense and I I refer to it in answers in the dark as going down the plug hole because it's dark down there And sometimes it's really difficult to get back up. So, yeah, when I talk about these experiences and certainly grief experiences, I think it's important for us as a society. And this is what I try to do in the book is just start a conversation. It's not to kind of, you know, say this is the only perspective. It's really just food for thought where I'm saying to people, I think we need to start a different conversation about grief and how it shows up, because if we're not talking about it in during the day, it is going to show up at night. Yeah, there's uh, that state that you can be in where maybe you're asleep and then you get up uh, yeah. and can't fall back asleep. But it's a it's a very vulnerable state. You're not completely awake and you're not asleep. So you're just you're raw. And, mm-hmm. and so those things that are disturbances do come out that way. 
And uh, I think sometimes, you know, usually it's two, three in the morning. That's what I, people always say to me. It's two in the morning and, and I can't fall asleep. And I'm, my mind is telling me things. Exactly um, that. Yeah. Um, I don't really have that much, which I'm kind of happy about, um, <laughs> but, but I have, <laughs> I have, I think we all have. That's that. Yeah, no, you're right. And one of the things that I really emphasize in the book as well is that it's quite normal for us to have, you know, a period of waking during the night. It's quite normal to some extent um, for us to wake up because our brain has this natural defense mechanism that wants to make sure everything's OK. So it's quite natural for us to wake up during the night. But it is what we do next that's going to make the difference about whether we go back to sleep or not. If I wake up and think to myself, oh, I'm awake. This is my brain working. This is just my way of checking everything's okay I'm going to go back to sleep now I'm more likely to doze off than if I sit there and think oh why am I awake what am I going to be like in the morning <laughs> or what time is it you know am I going to be able to work tomorrow am I going to be so tired I'm not going to be able to drive and so we start to get into this narrative as I say going down the plug hole and there is no way your brain is going to authorize sleep if if you're kind of turning yourself in knots you know, inside out in the middle of the night. So one of the things that I provide in the book, I have this section called the sleep cycle repair kit, which is really about offering people tips and ideas about what might help them get back to sleep if they find themselves awake in the middle of the night. And that includes all sorts from, you know, mindfulness activities, using mantras, um, even just, you know, techniques to manage the mind in the middle of the night and, and having different ways of approaching it. Because otherwise you're right, you know, you just, you're just going to turn yourself inside out and back to front. You know, there's, um, there's those type of dreams where you, they're, they're, I guess people say, oh, that was, it was so real. And they're, they can be, uh, well, a friend of mine went to uh, sleep and, uh, or his wife got up and she said, you know, I dreamt we were driving in the car and uh, you just kicked me out of the car and mm -hmm. drove away. And she was really mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, he said, uh, go back to sleep and I'll pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, it's so interesting though, isn't it? Because um, I've actually, one of the most common dreams that I've been contacted about over the years, aside from the, the flying dreams and, and other types, is people will contact me and say, and I have to say it's predominantly women, will contact me and say, I dreamt my partner is cheating. Is it true? <laughs> And, and they'll say to me, do you know, I didn't speak to him all day because I'm absolutely, you know, I had this dream last night that he was cheating on me and I just haven't spoken to him all day because I'm so mad at him. And, you know, and they'll, and they'll say to me, is it true? And, and I'm always so careful to say to people that dreams are often reflections of insecurities, you know, or worries or natural fears and frustrations that we have. So they show up symbolically, they show up in metaphor and things like that. You know, it's, it's so unusual um, for dreams to come true. That's not to say they don't. And I do talk about that in the book as well. Um, but, uh, it's, it's more often our dreams are a reflection of our fears and frustrations. And so, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting how sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll have these dreams and then we give people a hard time during the day as if, you know, as if that's what they've really done. <laughs> um, when actually, you know, they've done nothing wrong and they've got no idea, you know, what's, what's, how, what have I done? Um, and it's because, you know, they, they, they cheated on them in their dream and but it is interesting you know that um as i said i'm not that's not to say that men don't have that dream it's just that predominantly it's it's women that contact me to say is it true or is it going to come true and i always say to people in those situations if you're worried talk about it you know talk to them about it you know it's not it's it's not just because you've dreamt that doesn't mean that that's off limits you know that you can't talk about that you know you should be able to talk to your partner about your fears and frustrations so um you know it's okay to say to them you know i've, I've had this dream and, and i I wonder what it means so um so yeah but it, it is interesting isn't it and driving in a dream is an interesting one as well because sometimes it's worth noticing who is in the driving seat when we talk about metaphor we talk about who's in the driving seat so when we're in a car one of the things that we can observe as part of our dream recording which i i offer a template in answers in the dark um is well who's driving 
because that might give me an indication as to who I think is in the driving seat at the moment, who's in charge of, of our situation. Because if I'm driving, then obviously the dreamer is driving, then that would suggest that they're in control. Whereas if somebody else is driving them in the car, then it might be that they're, you know, they're, they're thinking that someone else is, is taking charge at the moment. So it's always worth exploring. But again, everybody is different. I love this stuff. I could talk about just the weird dreams I've had forever. You know, everybody wants to make it personal. Like I had this dream. What does it mean? <laughs> That's often what happens when I say to people, and especially now, since, you know, since I've written answers in the dark, um, you know, people will say to me, as soon as I say it talks about dreams, they're like, Oh, I had this really weird dream once. And one of the things I'm also careful to talk about is I mentioned earlier that, you know, sometimes our, and often our dreams are our fears and frustrations, but it's important to say also, that, that dreams aren't just spitting out, you know, our worries and our fears and frustrations. They've been used over time in so many different ways. So, for example, Albert Einstein was said to have dreamt the theory of relativity. Stephanie Mayer was said to have dreamt the Twilight Saga from start to finish, the books about Bella and Edward and vampires and wolves. So it's, it's you know, we, we can make the assumption that dreams are always something that we have to analyse or we have to scrutinise or, you know, we have to kind of dive deep um but actually creatively dreams have been used for, for a long time um to inform the work that we do keith richards was said to have dreamt the rift to i can't get no satisfaction when you said about having a tape recorder by your bed so the story goes that's exactly what keith richards does he has a guitar and a tape recorder by his bed in case he wakes up with another riff in his mind so you know it's it's important i think to to really um, like I say, keep an open mind and, and consider the possibilities that dreams are so much more than we might think they are. They're not always just the subconscious rattling of our mind. They could be giving us, you know, this, this incredible wisdom to work with. Well, the interesting thing about all that is that it, that I think intuitively as human beings, we, we know in some way that those messages are coming from a higher self mm. or certainly a different consciousness of self whether it's uh, whether we rank it as higher or lower doesn't really matter to me but that it's coming from a place like like the person that wakes up and is mad at their husband because they had a dream that they were cheating there's a magical part to that well that must be true because it's coming from this other place that's yeah. not here and yeah. so we do know that there is something important coming from there now music and maybe art um, you know, all kinds of interesting stuff. And that those, those, those dreams that I was talking about earlier that are more like experiences mm. are between the sort of conventional dream state and the waking state that feel very, they feel more important than other dreams. Like they're mm -hmm. really, um, you wake up uh, feeling altered in a way. Yeah, and that's one of the things I talk about in the book is visitation dreams. Um, and that's very much um, along the lines of what you're saying. And this is where uh, a person dreams of their deceased loved one and their deceased loved one appears to them in a dream. And one of the distinctions I make in the book is that we can almost start to think about this in terms of, okay, is this dream a form of nighttime therapy or is this person coming to me in my dreams to tell me a message of some kind? And in all the years I've been doing this, uh, and I talk about this in Answers in the Dark, is I've been able to kind of look at this from two different perspectives. If the dream of the deceased loved one, if in the dream their loved one appears to them and they are well, they are dressed in their favorite clothes and um, certainly if they were poorly before they died if they were sick before they died there's no presence of that in the dream they look well they look healthy they almost have this glow to them and um that is what we would call a traditional visitation dream because often the dreamer will wake up very much like you were saying a minute ago and think something really special has just happened. So um, it may well be that they were giving them a message that I'm okay now. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine where I am. Everything's going to be okay. And that is what we would look at as the traditional visitation dream. The dreamer wakes up feeling as if something really special has just happened, and they don't feel like they need to have that dream again. You know, it's almost like it was lovely that their their, their deceased loved one came to see them, but they don't feel like they need to see them again. It's almost 
almost like they had this mesh this message they're okay and they don't need any more than that whereas in other types of dreams and i found this particularly working with those that had been bereaved by murder and suicide sometimes those dreams would be really cruel and they would be dreams along the lines where the um in the dream the deceased loved one would be saying things like you should have known Mm. and and that for many people is really hard to process but what that is often is what i was saying about that nighttime therapy this is often when we're either not being given permission to talk about or feel what we feel during the day or to process what we're feeling during the day. And so those fears, those frustrations, those anxieties, those worries will appear to us in our dreams at night. And that's where I make this distinction about nighttime therapy. So I think it's, it's really important for us, like I say, to, to look at this big picture and think maybe there's more to my dream than I'm at first giving attention to. So the the dream of the the partner cheating, our instinct, like you say, is, well, is he, you know, is he up to something? Is he up to no good? But actually, if we take that a step further and say, but what might it be trying to tell me? What, What else might be going on for me that I might need to process? Yeah, I guess if you believe in the goodness of the universe, that that the message would be one of healing as opposed to cruelty in most of those situations. That, that that's a sort of core kind of feeling that I've always had that the universe itself is is about love and goodness, yeah. not cruelty. And that's exactly. a very human kind of thing. I so as you were talking about the first one, I'll, I'll tell you a, a dream uh, that I had when my father passed away. He was ninety four. And I felt that he was having a lot of trouble transitioning to wherever we go. Mm-hmm. And I, apparently there, there is, what do they talk about? The uh, auric body taking three or four days to transition. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I had to, uh, you know, I did s- see him um, in the, uh, at the mortuary, you know, he was, you know, laid out on the thing and I did see him and um and I said to my sister who was with me, I said, well, he's, he's not in there anymore in the body. And she goes, no, he still is. I can, I can tell he's still some of it's, you know, so, and then I started to really feel it for, for a few days that he hadn't transitioned mm-hmm. and that he was fighting it. He wasn't very, um, he wanted to believe in God, but he wouldn't basically, this is mm-hmm. who my dad was. Um, and it was an ache for him that he just couldn't bring himself to believe that so he um so one night i'm having uh, a dream and i'm in a i guess you would call it a drawing room (laughs) like an old-fashioned kind of with a wooden staircase and i'm sitting in a chair a comfortable sort of armchair and there's a curtain over the staircase and the curtain opens and down the stairs comes my grandfather who died when i was 16 and he's very matter of fact and he walks and he stands in front of me and he looks up the stairs. And I was very close to my grandfather. I've had a million dreams about him over the last 50 years. Um, so, but he doesn't say anything. He kind of looks up the stairs and my father walks down the stairs and he's not 94. He's like 30 mm-hmm. in robust health, big smile on his face, gives me a hug, is so happy to see me. I never had the dream again, of course, because like you said, I didn't need to. He was okay. And I knew that my grandfather was taking care of him and was helping him to come to where he'd been for 50 years. And it was such a cool dream. And I called my sister immediately and I told her the dream. She loved, she goes, oh, that is the sweetest dream. The only part I didn't tell her was my grandfather (laughs) was a little annoyed with my dad that he had to do this. Like he, like... (laughs) just a tad. He, he knew he, he wanted to do it, but he was like, Oh God, I got it. You know, like, like he had, he had been pulled out of some state that he was in that was, yes. you know, yeah. And had to, had to help him. Oh, 
Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And that is that is exactly what I was just talking about when I've spoken to people over the years and they've shared so much similar experiences of this, exactly what you said. Often it's, you know, they're appearing 20, 30, 40 years previously. They look healthy, they look well. Um, and they're coming to sort of say, you know, everything's cool, I'm fine, you carry on. And uh, and yeah, the, the dreamer will wake up feeling as if something really magical has just happened and and they're able to kind of move forward and that's one thing I'm again I'm always really careful to say is that we don't move on in grief we move forward Mm -hmm. um because I think move on implies that we forget and of course we don't you know we we never we never forget the ones we've loved so it's it's wonderful to hear that experience because that very much matches the experiences of those I've spoken with over time and that's why and that's that's not to minimize the other experiences where people have had dreams about their loved ones but the dream content in some way has been difficult to process and that's when I say that's the nighttime therapy that is your brain trying to figure out work out process talk about you know the things that are on your mind perhaps during the day but you're just not getting the time or the space that's safe enough for you to articulate how you feel especially with feelings like guilt shame and regret And because, and I say this a lot, you know, one of the things about feelings like guilt, shame, and regret is that we don't have to have done anything wrong to feel them. (laughs) <laughs> that's so you know? true and, and, yeah. and so they, they sh- but they show up anyway and so much of our guilt and our shame and our regret is not our burden to carry but we feel it anyway and so and that is sometimes why it can be so helpful then to to talk about it during the day and to have that reassurances from others that actually we did nothing wrong you know that actually it, we're we're okay um but that's why sometimes these things will show up in our dreams at night if we're just not getting the chance to process them during the day. I was thinking about certain, when you were just talking about certain people that will, if you pay attention, there's certain people that will start sentences quite often with, I feel bad because, and then they go into the the reason, Mm. like, man, you feel bad a lot. Mm. Nothing really happened. It's, I don't know why I just thought of that, but I, I it's true. And it's, it's so true though, because I think, I think societally, I actually refer to this in answers in the dark as the at fault position. Uh, so for example, okay. you're, you're in the supermarket, right? And someone comes crashing into you with their shopping cart, the shopping trolley. And the first words out of your mouth are, I'm so sorry, even though you've done <laughs> nothing wrong, you know, you've done nothing wrong and yet you're apologizing. And that is, I refer to this in answers in the dark as the at fault position. We are wired to take often to take responsibility for things that actually are not our responsibility. And for many people, they will carry that as a burden, you know, their whole lives, unless they can start to separate what is theirs to carry and what isn't. Um, And again, this is how it shows up in our dreams, because we will, you know, constantly feel as if something is our fault. And yet actually, that might not be our burden to carry. So this is where if we pay attention to our dreams, sometimes those messages will come to us in our dreams let's talk about grief for a second because i have well i'm hesitating because i'm it's embarrassing to me the i barely uh i I have an idea of what grief is supposed to look like okay Mm -hmm. and it's probably not accurate because when my both my parents have passed away within the last five years and i barely cried and I thought, well, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to sob when your your parents died. But I wasn't, I miss them, but I wasn't really that, um, I didn't feel that sad about it because I they led long lives, I think. And I just, I'm like, am I shutting this out because I don't want to look at it? Is it not time yet? Or maybe this won't happen. I, I don't know. But I actually f- felt kind of uh, guilty for not being sadder it's uh and experiencing yeah. the grief the way you see it in the movies anyway you know yeah w- wailing you. and uh, <laughs> yeah, hitting the yeah. ground and weeping and you know yeah i hear you and and thank you again for sharing that with me because i think this is a really important conversation one of the things i talk about in answers in the dark is that grief can be all the emotions and it can be none of them one of the things that i 
I say somewhat controversially in the book, I think, and I know some people won't be happy with me for saying it, is that there are no stages of grief. And I think we've got into this trap. And actually, I I say this in the book, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is quoted as or or is sort of kind of credited with coming up with that, she didn't actually say that. She wasn't talking about grief when she talked about stages. She wasn't talking about this idea that, you know, we there's this linear process of grieving that we're going to feel shock and then we're going to feel denial and then we're going to feel, you know, right the way through to acceptance, moving through those stages. Grief is more like a roller coaster than it is a flight of stairs. And yet we've kind of got into this idea that we're getting grief wrong if we're not, um, you know, following that timeline of what it should look like. And so, you know, so many people have said to me over the years, but I didn't cry at the funeral or I didn't, um, you know, I don't feel that I need to cry. You know, I don't feel that I've I've got that. And we make these uh, assumptions that we then, without realising it, and when I say we in this context, I mean society, we all kind of imprint that message to other people. Well, this is what grief looks like if you're doing it right. Yeah. And, and of course, again, grief is different to everybody. Some people will, um, you know, some people will find that they're, um, they, they don't cry at all because exactly as you said, they don't need to, they don't, they, they feel that they're, you know, they're processing what's happened. They feel settled and they feel satisfied that, you know, they've, they've done everything they need to do. So they don't necessarily need to express their emotions in that way. But some people will feel numb for years. Yeah. And that's part of their grieving process. That's part of them them processing it. Um, in the same way as some people might feel fine initially, and then as time goes on, they might start to find that, you know, some of their feelings are unraveling a little bit. So there's no kind of fixed way no right way no and i and i think this is where we again you know starting that conversation as a society we need to talk about that you know we need to recognize one of the feelings we don't talk about uh, in grief is relief right and i and i think that's an important thing to talk about in grief some people naturally feel relieved for all sorts of reasons you know especially if their loved one has been sick for a very long time yeah. Some people will naturally feel relieved when their loved one has passed. And yet they feel so scared of saying that. They feel so scared of saying out loud, oh, I feel so relieved that they're not in pain anymore. Or I feel so relieved that they're not suffering anymore. Or any number of reasons they feel relieved. Um, And that includes their relationship they had with them. So I think those are the, the feelings. It's almost as if there's like acceptable and unacceptable feelings in grief. Whereas to, to me, they're all valid. You know, all emotions have their own intelligence. They're trying to tell us something. So if we can look at it that way, then we can find our way from there. I just love listening to this stuff. This is so great. I'm going to tell you something I talked about this morning. It has to do with suicide. And it's not wasn't a dream thing. I I had a friend. I was telling another friend of mine about this today. I had a very close friend that I known since I was thirteen, and in in his forties, he he, uh, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And at the time, my wife was uh, was pregnant. So a couple of months after um, he uh, he died, we were she was giving birth, and um, I felt him in the room. Now I wasn't, I was awake, obviously, and it was a heightened state, obviously, because there was new life coming in and doctors Mm -hmm. and all kinds. So I I had this experience, he's in the room and he's watching and he's really happy about, you know, he's just, it was more like a protection of some kind or just presence. Mm -hmm. Like he wanted to be there. So I didn't say anything to my wife, you know, I just didn't think there was an appropriate Hey, guess what <laughs> is going on? So I, <laughs> so we get home and a couple of days later, she says to me, Bill was in the room, you know, when uh, the baby was born. And I go, you felt that too? She goes, yeah, yeah, he was there. I felt him. Wow. Um, now that certainly wasn't just me having an experience. It was both of us had the experience 
And it was as real in that in that moment. I was I could you know I couldn't see a uh, an image of anything or yeah. hear anything. I just knew it, and she knew it too. So uh, I was just thinking like that's sort of like a dream, but it's a, it's definitely an experience that felt yeah. felt well. It was real. It was re- as real as anything, you know. Exactly. And and one of the things I'm always um, again careful to say to people is when people tell me their experiences. I always, you know, kind of come at it from the approach of, did it help you feel better? Was it, you know, was it something that felt cherishing to you and nurturing and nourishing to you? Because who am I to say that it's not real or real or, you know, it's it's not my role to do that. My role is to listen and to explore and understand and, you know, and help unpack and things like that. And one of the things I talk about in the book as well is there is still so much we don't know I don't think we can categorically say one way or the other. And and I'm thinking particularly about predictive dreams when I talk about this. I mentioned this earlier that some people, I have spoken to people who have very articulately told me about dreams they had, which clearly predicted the future. And I've had these myself. I have genuinely lost count of the number of people that I knew were pregnant before they told me I remember messaging a friend of mine and saying have you got something to tell me and she replied damn it you know how did you know and it was because I dreamt it so I I think this is one of those things and I know that some scientists and some researchers would you know be very dismissive of those experiences but one of the things I argue in the book is we've only been scratching the surface of sleep science, for example, for the last hundred years or so, we do not know enough about the mind and the brain. And as you were saying about these, you know, this, this other context about these higher powers, higher energy, God, which, you know, however we want to refer to it, we don't know enough. And like I said earlier, we mustn't forget, uh, or we mustn't fall into the trap of Westernizing our dreams. You know, we have to remember that in certainly in Eastern countries um, and in some other parts of the world, dreams are a portal. They are a divine portal for our loved ones and our ancestors to come to us and tell us meaningful information about our health and our wealth. So I'm really, really keen to emphasize, you know, that we, we just don't know enough to dismiss other people's experiences. I think we need to be open to these conversations because like you said, the fact that you and your wife had the same experience. One of the things that I um, I also talk about in Answers in the Dark is mutual dreaming. So that's where two people have had exactly the same dream and they mm. met each other in the night. And then the next day they've said, oh, I, I dreamt this last night. And their friends said, so did I. I, I was there, I saw it. And so, you know, it's it, it, we just don't know enough yet to be able to say that's not true or that didn't happen. I think we have to be open to these experiences and respect the fact that many people are telling us that they have these dreams. But of course, you know, scientifically speaking, if a person says, oh, I had a dream which came true, a scientist might say, well, I'm going to put you in a lab and I want you to have a dream that comes true. And of course, they're not going to be able to do that. It doesn't work like that. So I think this is why, you know, it's so important, like I say, that we just keep an open mind and we listen to people and their experiences when so many people are telling me that the types of experiences you've just described. um, I absolutely believe that, you know, these are these are things that we need to be talking about. Indigenous people have always had that sort of, like you say, a portal to uh, through dreams. And then it's sort of and certainly in Western culture, it was pushed way back to the side or way over to the side where people think, oh, that's just nothing. Yeah. It's just that, you know, and, and now yeah. you're bringing this back into a, in, in, into a way with some, probably some science, I would imagine, 
mixed in. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of dream research going on. I don't know if you talk about that in the book because I haven't read it yet. A lot of people tend to come at this from the perspective of Sigmund Freud or they come at it from the perspective of Carl Jung. Um, but actually, there's been over the years, there's been many, many dream researchers. You know, those aren't the only two people that have ever stopped to talk about dreams in our history. And actually, if we take it even further back, there are written records of dreams and our interpretations of them going back hundreds, if not thousands of years. So I think this is why, again, we just need to keep an open mind and more, most importantly, listen to people. If they're telling us they're having these experiences, but we try to almost like force them into a particular category, we're only getting one bite of the apple. We're not necessarily appreciating the full experience that they've had. And so, yeah, I, I think we just, we need to start this conversation and open it up for exploration. My fantasy about dreams would be that when we advance enough, you know, we're already talking about putting computer chips in people's brains to make them smarter. But wouldn't that be cool to be able to tie that in with media and literally watch your dreams the next morning in as accurate a way as you have them that night? I, that's just I that's that. way it's way down the road. <laughs> but if at all, but I, I was like, God, that was so cool. I want to see that again. <laughs> I know. And I, and this is another thing. This is where it is. So I do this when I'm doing my, uh, when I'm delivering training on this, but I, I explain to people, you know, if I, if I have in my mind a vision of a black cat, for example, my black cat might look completely different to your black cat. So we can't even make the assumption that if we dream about the same thing, that that yeah. thing would look the same. But yeah, I've joked with people where I've said, wouldn't it be great if we could like stick a USB stick into the oh. side of our heads <laughs> yeah, and just download what we dreamt the night before so that I can show it to you and I can say, look, see, this was the dream I had. Look at me flying. Can you believe that? You know, I think it would be great to be able to do that. Yeah, But then again, what perspective would that be from it would you know because it might switch you know be really uh, it'd be just but it's uh, it's all this stuff that's fantastical that can't actually happen in you know the material plane would to see that would just be so amazing yeah, no, it, it really would. And, and as you say, it's, it's again, which perspective? I've spoken to people before that have told me that in their dream, they were the observer. So they were actually watching their dream as if they were watching the TV unfolding. So again, it's 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 that whole thing. We, we're not even always us in our dreams. We're almost like uh, we've stepped back like an out-of-body experience. You know, we've kind of stepped out of our own bodies to observe what's happening in the dream. Even if we are also in the dream, we're almost observing ourselves in the dream. And again, you know, researchers would have different opinions, you know, analytically what that might mean. But, um, you know, other people I've spoken to would say to me, oh, you know, one person I spoke to said that they could always tell their dream was going to be uh, predict the future if it looked a certain way oh. so um you know it's again it's about being open to those experiences but again what it was for one person doesn't mean it's the same for another well if i could predict the future in my dreams i would just dream probably about the stock market <laughs> <laughs> you know, i genuinely met somebody once who told me that um in their dream they were dreaming about this box and in this box was the lottery numbers. And in the dream, they would go to open the box. And just as they were about to open the box, they'd wake up. So they never got to know what the lottery numbers were. And they were contacting me to say, how do I stay asleep <laughs> so that I can find the lottery numbers? And I was just like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> that in my repertoire. I don't have that in my That's repertoire. so literal. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> is, you know and i get it i absolutely get it I, and and they weren't the first person to do that i've had that many times where people have contacted me with with that kind of experience where they they knew that something that was going to win them some money was there and they <laughs> just wanted to know how to fix it and i i just don't have that in wow. my reputation. i was just kidding i just <laughs> i didn't think that people would take that seriously no true it's true oh, it's so funny 
thank you so much for talking to me today. I could do okay. this for another five hours, but uh, oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank yes. you so much. Let's talk about your book and how people can get it. Uh, once again, I'll do that at the beginning too. But let's uh, let's make sure that the folks that have been enthralled with your discussion uh, can get the book and really find out about all these cool things we just talked about. Oh, thank you so much. So um, the book is Answers in the Dark and it has its own website. So if you go to answersinthedark.com, you'll find different buying options depending on your preferences where you can get the book from there. Um, if people want to just find more about me, they can just go to my website, which is delphiellis.com and they'll see all the different conversations I have about grief and dreams and, um, you know, all the different kind of stuff that I talk about. Fantastic. I did go to the book website and I loved it. So Oh, thank Folks, you. check out the book. Check out DelphiEllis.com. Have a beautiful day. Happy dreams to everyone. Thank you, Delphi. Thanks so much. Thank you. Much appreciation for you guys listening to The Exploding Human. Check out the website, TheExplodingHuman.com, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman YouTube channel, and The Exploding Human Facebook page. Once again, big, big thanks to Delphi Ellis. Please check out her new book, Answers in the Dark, and you can also check out her website, DelphiEllis.com, D-E-L-P-H-I-E-L-L-I-S.com. Have a fantastic day. Bye.